Good evening. I'm Karen Swartz, the Director of Clinical and Educational Programs at our Mood Disorder Center. On behalf of the center and its directors, Dr. DiPaolo and Dr. Jamison, as well as our chair, Jimmy Potash, I'd like to welcome you to this evening's Psychiatry in the Arts program. This evening, we have a really remarkable pair of talented individuals who have both been successful in their professions and have had lives that have been definitely touched by bipolar disorder and they have been very open about their experiences. One of the challenges of those with bipolar disorder have is having family and friends not understand their experiences when either depressed or manic. Similarly, family members can struggle to explain how the illness affects them and what it's like when someone you love is in the midst of this challenging situation, which is at times even terrifying. In his film, Touch with Fire, Paul Dalio beautifully captures both. This evening, first we will hear from the writer and director of Touch with Fire, Paul Dalio, as he shares a series of scenes from the film. Following our opportunity to watch the scenes, there will be a conversation with Dr. Kay Jamison, Paul Dalio, and Dr. Thomas Trail. And at that point during that conversation, you all have opportunities to ask them questions. So let me start by sharing a little background about Paul Dalio. Paul Dalio studied screenwriting at NYU Tisch School of the Arts at age 20. After graduating in 2004, he went to LA to work for a film producer, and he had his first psychotic episode. After three years in and out of hospitals, Paul finally stabilized himself and attended the NYU graduate filmmaking program in 2007, where he met his wife and collaborator, Christina Niklova, and his professor, Spike Lee. We don't have any professors at Hopkins quite as famous as Spike Lee. Spike Lee became his mentor and executive producer for his first feature debut, Touch with Fire, starring Katie Holmes and Luke Kirby, a love story between two bipolar poets who bring all of the horror and beauty of their shared condition inspired by Paul's personal journey. Through his engagement in treatment and partnering with his doctor, he was able to change his perception of his illness from one of a curse to one as a gift. In the segments we see this evening, there's a great appreciation of how he took his symptoms now portrayed on film and used them to inspire his art. He wrote, directed, scored, and edited the film. It was a New York Times critic's pick, which called it an extraordinary, sensitive, and non-judgmental exploration of bipolar disorder and creativity. It received the SAMHSA Voice Award, the International Bipolar Foundation Imagine Award, and the Dee Dee Hirsch Foundation Erasing the Stigma Leadership Award. He also received the Ryan Lick Sang Bipolar Foundation Shining Star Award, as well as the, Mayo, the Yale Mental Health Research Advocacy Award. Paul and his wife currently live in New York with their two children and are working on their next two projects. So please welcome Paul Dalio, who is going to introduce and share his film with you. Hey, thank you guys so much. This is a huge privilege for me because I made the film for you and your patients most of all. I really was excited for the opportunity to dig deeper into some of the key moments of the film and explain how I actually got from a place of seeing this thing as a curse to seeing it as a gift, which is a rare thing, but I have the most severe form of the condition, so I know it's achievable. And really all of that came from my understanding of what this thing was and what this thing is, which is what I hoped the movie would do. When people say, okay, well, so is this thing based on your real life? And, uh, it's, uh, and they see it's a love story. They you know, some want to get all the juicy details about the love story part, but it's really about the love-hate relationship of the condition, which is something that I think everyone who has bipolar experiences, you wonder, you, everyone asks, why would you go off the meds? Why would you embrace the mania? And all of it comes from this love-hate relationship. And really, that all starts with the confusion of looking outside your sanitarium window to see the view of the sky that Van Gogh saw 
out of sight of his sanitarium window. It's confusing when you come down and then you're handed a pamphlet and that pamphlet says you have a genetic disorder, you're never gonna be the same, and you'll fall into the one of four suicide statistic if you don't take your medication, which make you feel like a zombie, and all you know is you're not gonna go back to being the person you once were. So this first clip, to me, represented what I was like when I, when I first got diagnosed, and what the, that experience was like, so. Hey. Hi. Okay? Yeah. Can I come in? Yeah. Yeah, come in. I know it's almost one in the morning. Should, should I be sleeping? Sorry. That's okay. What's wrong? I just wanted to talk. What? Sure. Can we look at some photo albums? Now? <laughs> why, why do you want to do that? Just to talk about the past. I, 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 just, I just don't know where they are, honey. They're lost. In the I know where they are. I'll find them. Here. 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 That was right before I got sick. Remember? What was I like? Maybe. You don't remember? No. You were the same. Mom, I need you to be honest with me. I, you're the only one who, who knew me back then, and no, I need you. That's, that's not true. There's a lot of people in your life who knew you then. What was I doing when it happened? What do you mean? Well, I mean, the doctor said that something has to trigger it. So what was I no, doing? No, 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 no. There was nothing that we could have done. It was going to happen no, no matter no, what. No, 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 no. She said, I, I must have done something to no, trigger it because I am you not didn't. the same person, Mom. You didn't. Um, you I am not the same. The same person. Would you please just stop lying to me? OK, Carly, you, you are acting really hyper right now. And I, 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 are you sleeping OK? What's, what's going on? I'm just trying to figure out who I, who I am, you know, because I don't feel like myself anymore. Even when I go off the medication, I don't feel like myself. OK. Um, you know what, honey? I think we need to get Dad because he can really help. No, 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 Mom. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have yelled. I won't yell again. Please don't okay. get down. You're right. Sit down. And um, I have a really good plan, OK? This is my plan. You're going to spend the night tonight. And then tomorrow morning, first thing, we'll go to the hospital and get your file. See, they have a file of everything about your illness. And then you can learn anything you want. You can ask anything, OK? We'll figure all this out, OK? I hate it when you look at me like that. Like what? How am I looking at you? Like I'm crazy. I'm not looking at you like you're crazy, honey. No, you're looking at me like you don't even recognize me. No, honey, I, I love you. I, no, no, you please don't the please. That I used please, to be. please don't leave. Donald. That is what I was like until I came across an amazing book by one of your very own, uh, Kay Jameson. Uh, I stumbled into it, and it was a complete re-education that cleaned out of my mind all the stale, dry cynicism of the pamphlet that I got at the hospital. You know, it wasn't clinical. It was, it was written like poetry. It was illustrated like a painting. And suddenly, it framed this thing that I always considered to be a curse and a defect in my humanity to be a potential gift in my humanity that could contribute to humanity. And the issue for me was, if I was told to go on this journey and you're gonna be climbing up Mount Everest with naked with no rope and there's some glorious, redeemable 
uh, end to this journey, I'll take it in a second. But the issue of if you're going to be laying in a sick bed and you're going to be have no place in humanity, that's really the killer. And it was that re-education that allowed me to embrace it. I, I sort of resigned to turning my back on a comfortable uh, path of living with no emotion to a torrentious path of living with, uh, as, the, as, as the, the great bipolar poet said, living with, with the candle on both ends. This was exactly what my life was like once I embraced it. Hey, what, what happened to your apartment? What do you mean? I mean, your books are all over the floor. Yeah, um, I decided that I liked it better this way. You know, I, you can see all the titles way more easily, you know, and they're, they're all placed in different specific locations. It actually works out really great because you can just walk up to any one of them, you know, you can walk up to any book you want at any time, just sit down. There was a good variety of reading environments. I don't know. It just seems stupid somehow to just like want to put a bunch of books together in one place. That just seems like in the box thinking to me. Do you know what I mean? Mm. How are you sleeping? Mm, good. I just lie down and sleep. It's good. That all works out. Mm -hmm. Been taking your medication? Um, I found that they really weren't working for me. You know, it kind of constricted my emotions. You know, like a dried up potion. It wasn't the potion. <laughs> It'll give you the lotion. I just, um, yeah, it just didn't work, so I stopped. You know what I found works, though? What's that? Marijuana, mama. You're smoking marijuana. Yeah, it, 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 it actually really helps. It, you know, it, it, it works way better than the medication. Isn't that interesting? I mean, I guess it has something to do with my particular brain chemistry. Something about that works. You smoke a lot of marijuana? Um, depends on how long I'm awake for, you know. Uh, lately I haven't needed as much sleep, so. <laughs> I guess I have to up my dosage. Tomorrow morning, let's go. Let's go to Dr. Lyons and we'll ask him and just hear what he thinks about that. Who cares what he thinks? He's an expert on your illness. I He'll don't know. have an illness. Come on, Mike. Why are you bringing Dr. Lyons into that? There's nothing wrong. Let's wait, just... wait, wait, wait. That, what is? He's an expert no, on your medication. He's not a fucking he's expert. He's a goddamn Nazi. He doesn't fucking know what he's talking okay. about, okay? okay? Listen, I don't have an illness. Why don't you just, please, come home with me tonight. Come home. Home? Home. Yeah. Right? Is she there? Huh? Where is she? Who? She left because she's ill. She's ill. She. Why do you keep she, saying that? She couldn't stand that. And you know what happened? She fucking got away. Okay. You know why? Because she's a genius. She's no. a fucking genius. Why couldn't you see that? Okay. Count the dead. Remember how she used to do that? Remember? Do you remember this? Okay, count to ten. Oh, come on, Mark. Just count to ten. Ready? Yeah. Okay. One, One two, nine, three, ten, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You're it! Oh, Marco, no, no! <laughs> This is sort of the, the essence of the internal struggle of how to reconcile those two sides of yourself, Marco's side and Carla's side, when they're both real and they're both true. And this sort of, this next clip really kind of captures the falling in love, not between just the two characters, but the mania and the magic of the mania. And you'll notice that the first moment of the clip 
refers to that manic view of the sky through Van Gogh's sanitarium window. Here we go. Van Gogh, top member of the Bipolar Club. You see this? Yes, it's beautiful. Yeah, that's right. You know why? Why? Because it's the painting of the sky he saw from his sanitarium window while he was manic. Really? Yeah. You don't believe me? Yeah. Go look it up. I believe you. Well, when you go out tonight and you look at the sky and you see how dull it is, think about if you would have medicated Van Gogh. I climbed to the top of a building. up to the moon, asking it to take me home. And all of a sudden, I felt this light shining on my face. And I thought, my God, it's working. I get to go home and you know what? You know, maybe... Maybe... You're right. I mean, maybe we are aliens. Me too. Lunatic mind ticks in sync with lunar time. The more the moon pulls the tides, the more it lifts our minds. The more the sunlight shines on the moon, the more manic we become. places. Mm -hmm. But this, this is a manic brain, fully lit. And that's what you call illumination. It's the sages, the prophets, <laughs> through the ages who wrote about the gods. The prophets, when they were manic, that was, that was when they were, they were almost reaching full illumination, and that was right, right before they died. That's the 13th hour. That's what right, you're talking right, about. That, that's, that's illumination. What I'm saying. It's these pyramids. They all face the heavens. This is intricate cosmic mapping, ways out. These all have to do with escaping, to somehow getting out of the body, this flesh. Well, they did find certain stones, metals that absorb energy. And the, and the metals absorb the heavens, reaching up to the tip of the pyramid to the sun, inviting its light in. Schools get lost. They won't. We'll keep each other oriented. 
What if we lose each other? If we lose each other, then we come back to our bodies. Okay, we come back to our bodies and we remember this. We remember this map, okay? And we remember it's in this book and it'll be on this page, all right? And it'll be right here in the top right corner. Yeah, that's kind of the feeling of the magic at night was actually the reason why there was the Tchaikovsky's because uh, earlier on, Marco's kind of bragging to her about all the names of the people listed in Touch With Fire and drops uh, uh, Tchaikovsky as, uh, and that is the song, you know, of the world coming to magic at night. Uh, but this next clip is obviously the inevitable aftermath of that kind of love affair. Take one like four hours ago. It's the same one. You've been in the tub for four hours. Comforts me. See you there. How you feeling? Same.
the depression was actually the hardest thing to capture dramatically because it, from the outside it just looks like you're tired and you're sleeping. This next clip I felt best embodies the relationship between the parents, the patients, the doctors, and the whole disconnect between them when the patient doesn't feel validated, doesn't, the patient knows that the doctor has no idea what they're experiencing, or, the pa or that the parent has no idea what they're experiencing, and the parents are lo lost with no manual, no understanding of how to communicate to, th to their children or or, or save them. So um, I just, I, I want to orient my, uh, myself, I, I, if you don't mind. Uh, my wife, uh, you know, Sarah had uh, updated me a, a, a little on the background of the situation. You, um, you met uh, Carla uh, in the hospital. That's right. We met in, um, <laughs> well, group therapy. They, um, you have to do group therapy every day. That's nice that you were able to connect the, in that environment. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, and, but right, this was right before you both went manic. Uh, when you have this illness, you uh, actually go manic before you go into the hospital bed. Oh, of course. I, well, that's true. Um, I, I'm sorry. No, I meant, but, but right after you met, then what would we say? You went more, more. manic. It, it did increase, more. is it? Well, we brought out each other's nature. That's what you're driving at. So I guess that's so one you, way of putting it. You, but you admit that you bring out each other's illness, right? right? No, I'm saying that it's our nature to feel things more deeply than what's considered normal. And not to, but that's really not what I, I understand it, that it's sort of not um, a norm. No, I that's understand what I'm it saying. It's an illness. You, I, I, don't, I don't think we should get caught up if I may, just on whether it's a disease or nature or something. I think the point is, and the reason we're here, is uh, you both have it. And uh, I guess we're just concerned that you might be a bad influence on each other. That's well, but, it. Well, but because we both share it, we're the only ones that can relate to each other. It's beautiful. Well, I understand that. Well, well, excuse me, but you understand that? The doctor, remember the doctors told us? I mean, let's face it. You know, if they, if they signed up for a dating website, you know, and they put down mentally ill, it's not like they're going to attract a whole lot of people saying, oh, that's my soulmate, right? Um, maybe this is a, a chance for them to have a real relationship. You know, and if they stay on the medication, quite frankly, I've got no problem with that. But that's the whole issue, right? Mom, can you just listen to him? We Mom, can't just, take them this. OK, well. Just Marco. as I thought. What are you talking about? You know what I'm talking about. Marco, listen, you know that it's going to take time until mm. you find the, the, the right dosage, mm. right? Mm. Even the doctor. The doctor has said that eventually you are going to feel mm. a, a, the wide range of normal emotions. And how does he know? He's not taking the meds. The doctor does not take the meds. You so know that. Then I can't just trust him. And I don't think it's such a bad thing to feel life with the deepest emotion. I don't think that's a problem. It's an illness. Well, maybe for you, because maybe you have a low emotional capacity, and so to you, it makes you feel no, sick. No, 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 I don't but have, no, wait, 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 wait a minute. I don't have well, a low emotional attack. capacity. Okay. I'm sorry. I feel I'm things just fine. I understand. Mom, you don't, Mom, you don't have to get My upset. only question. Well, how like, dare you say that? If, I mean. Okay. Um, as an example, if you, like, how many hours do you spend a week with your husband? Oh, my God. No, this is, no, no, I'm not, just, this is not about us. As many hours as any marriage. No, I would like to, I'd like to answer that. Okay. We spend many hours a week together. I would spend every waking I, moment okay. with your daughter. I, so you mean, you mean, insanity is love. That, that, that you have to be crazy to be in love? Is that what you're saying? Love. That's not that what, what I'm saying. You don't understand, oh, no, Dad. I understand, you can't, you I understand can't, more than you know. And if you think... That, no. that, that there's any romance in being crazy, you're, you're crazy. No, if you understood, then mom wouldn't have left. Your mother, she left because she was sick. She left because you thought she was sick, because she was wild, and you were tame, and you wanted to tame her, Dad. So where is her love, Dad? Dad. No, really, where is it? When was the last Dad, time you heard from Dad. your mother? Excuse me. Oh, God. <clears throat> you can't listen to him. He's 
wrong. You know that. This is not a gift. It's an illness that needs to be treated. I've gotten you through so much, honey. You have to trust me right now because sometimes your illness doesn't let you think completely clearly, but you've got to believe me. Sweetheart, oh, please don't. Be don't. Upset. No, in the story, uh, I think as in life, with people who are bipolar, they don't listen to the parents or the doctors, and usually they have to suffer themselves enough to learn the lesson, and unfortunately, many aren't fortunate enough to actually get through that alive. In the case of <clears throat> Marco and Carla, because they tie so much the love of their affair to the mania, uh, the question really comes down to, well, if you're going to take your love to the end of the line, what that means is the most meaningful sense of what love is, and that means having a kid, raising a family, that means a deep, profound emotional life that can only exist with a deep, profound life. And so when they get to that point, uh, Carla and Marco, have a divided opinion on that because uh, he wants to stay off the meds and he thinks that he can raise the child with the magic of mania and, and she uh, says you're being crazy, we, you have to get medicated and eventually it will force them to lead to the choice of an abortion because of Carla's prudence uh, and because of Marco's foolishness. Now I know a lot of people would say, well, couldn't they have the baby? You know, couldn't they, couldn't have worked out? But I know that if it worked out in this movie, there would be a Marco out there in the audience who would be watching this thing, being like, I know he could have gotten away with it. I know he could have, they could have burned the candle at both ends for the rest of their lives and raised the kid. So my hope was that the tragedy of the film itself would prevent people from living the tragedy if they hopefully saw the film and understood it. The, at the end, the message and the reconciliation and the understanding of everything they went through, they're both you know, in, into poetry, you know, and uh, they, they both share that as a passion and so finally they come together after the abortion and they write a poem together that sums up everything they learned through this journey, which really sums up what I've learned. As the sun and moon aligned in the sky, they illuminated each other's shine. And the closer to each other they moved, the brighter they shined. And the higher the fire inside of us grew. As we raced through the days on that flame, each footprint we laid blazed away that piece of the Earth's entire lifetime of beauty. In the brief second, it touched our feet, leaving nothing but ashes beneath us. Until we had no ground left to stand on and nowhere left to flee. And now that we've turned away from our fire to face the days that remained unburned by the flames and learn to gaze at them through sane eyes one day at a time, we can look back at our book with clear sight and give it the ending that we never got the chance to write. And while I know it's too late to pick up the ripped up pages, I will admit, I still think of our little prints. And sometimes I go outside and look up at the sky and think about what planet he might have gone back to after he died. And I imagine the three of us living up there as a family in another lifetime. But for now, you have your own life and I have mine. And we have to live them the way we would have if we could go back to the day we conceived our child and we're able to see what our manic eyes were blind to at the time. We 
When the sun and moon finally came as close as they could be, and the fire inside us rose to its highest peak, it leaped past the fading ashes of our flesh to burn our love into eternity through our baby, that eternal flame that could blaze brighter than our manic one ever could on its brightest mania days, but that would also sustain. Now, I think it's no coincidence that when I wrote this and I wrote the child into the script, I hadn't quite yet uh, had my own child. But I did have my wife, and we were in love, and obviously it was somewhere in the back of my mind. And fate has a way of guiding you on the right path. And I th believe it was one of the greatest blessings that actually our child was born on the last day of the shoot. Christina was in the hospital. And it was the day that we filmed that scene right there of them two reading it, that book at the, at the bookstore. And it was the difference between me learning to accept this thing as a gift and embrace it and manage it, but at the same time, do it in a way that keeps in perspective that the beauty of life cannot exist without a substance in the actual relationships in, the, in, the, in, in, your, in your existence. Only if you can see the beauty in this thing and learn how to embrace it and embody it and, and shine with it in society, can we actually thrive with happiness? And uh, right now, what we're, we're living in, in this society is we have people who don't want to be open about bipolar, who want to go off their meds because they don't want to acknowledge they have bipolar, who go off their meds because they've been given no education whatsoever that you can actually thrive with the gifts of this thing. Until that day, there will be no funding for bipolar because no one will care about it. There will be no people accepting their own bipolar. There will be misunderstanding, all of that. So with that last note, I wanted to leave you with the list of people in Kay Jamison's amazing book that changed my life that I took for the title of the film, uh, who contributed so much to humanity, partially because of this thing, that we so rapidly label simplistically just a disease.
Thank you all so much for listening. Um, it's an honor to be able to share this with you. I'd like to take a moment just to introduce the two others who are going to come and join this conversation with Paul. The first is Dr. Kay Redfield Jameson, maybe someone who doesn't need much of an introduction, but you should know about her. She is the Dalio Professor in Mood Disorders, Professor of Psychiatry at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, and co-director of the Johns Hopkins Mood Disorder Center with Dr. Raymond DiPaolo. She is also Honorary Professor of English at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. She is co-author of the Standard Medical Text on Manic Depressive Bipolar Illness, which has, uh, was chosen as the outstanding book in biomedical sciences by the American Association of Publishers and author of Touch with Fire, An Unquiet Mind, Night Falls Fast, Exuberance, and Nothing Was the Same. Dr. Jameson has written more than 125 scientific and clinical articles about mood disorders, suicide, creativity, and lithium. Her memoir, An Unquiet Mind, which chronicles her own experiences with bipolar illness, was on the New York Times bestseller list for five months and translated into 30 languages. Night Falls Fast, Understanding Suicide, was a national bestseller and selected by the New York Times as a notable book of 1999. Exuberance, The Passion for Life, was selected by the Washington Post, Seattle Times, and the San Francisco Chronicle as one of the best books of 2004, and by Discover Magazine as one of the best science books of the year. Her most recent book, Robert Lowell, Setting the River on Fire, was a Pulitzer Prize finalist and selected as one of the best books of 2017 by the Washington Post, the Boston Globe, the Seattle Times, the Irish Times, and the Times Literary Supplement, as well as the New Statesman. Dr. Jameson is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the Royal Society of Edinburgh, as well as the recipient of numerous literary and scientific awards, including the Lewis Thomas Prize, the Sarnot Prize from the National Academy of Medicine, and a MacArthur Fellow. She is going to join us along with Dr. Thomas Trail, who is a cardiologist, a professor of medicine at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, and if I may be permitted a small personal aside, was one of my important professors when I was in medical school here. He is a wonderful clinician and teacher. He introduces himself as, this is a quote, Kay Jamison's an unbelievably fortunate husband. <laughs> so may we please ask Drs. Trail and Jamison to join Paul for our conversation. There are many, many things about the film that are remarkable, the complexity of mania and the complexity of depression. But I think from my point of view, in a way, and I think many people have said this, the capacity to understand families without being judgmental about how difficult it is for them. What's particularly moving and powerful is the portrayal of the parents and the family members who have to struggle with having uh, not a clue about how to deal with this. Nobody's given a roadmap uh, to how to deal with a child who gets manic or severely depressed. They just aren't. So it's bravo. So if you have questions, we'd like to invite those now. So the question pointing out how many really remarkable poets, writers, artists have had bipolar disorder, the question is, is there a reason that this is an illness that has continued, that has remained in the gene pool? Is there something that it's adding as a part of you know, a reason that it remains? Um, I've heard different, that's a great question, because I've heard different theories on that, uh, philosophies. My understanding of what this thing is, bipolar, after a lot of reflection and a lot of thought, boiling it down to all it is is that the brain at some point, in subjectively speaking and scientifically speaking, you're in college, you know, you're pushing yourself, you're having insights, you're, you're working hard and the electrical synapses are connecting and at some point the currents completely 
flood the entire brain and you're forming connections between everything. From the outside, that looks like someone who's sick. But what it is really, in its essence, is a person who is capable of experiencing the highest level of cognition that, w that the brain wasn't quite ready to fully sustain. And when you look at it that way, you can see how that is something that evolution would want to sustain. But if you look at it from, you know, a clinical lens, or no offense to cl clinicians or anything, but, <laughs> but if you look at, you know, then it just looks like this sick person who's got a disorder, you know? I, I think addressing specifically the evolution and the advantages to not only the, the society, because as scientists and entrepreneurs as well as artists and writers and people in the arts, that it's, there are a lot of studies and some very large studies of hundreds of thousands of people now showing that it's not just, in the case of bipolar illness, there's a, um, a, an advantage in the arts to having bipolar disorder and a way disproportionate rate. Uh, if you look at schizophrenia and bipolar illness, in schizophrenia, there's not the advantage to individuals, but there is the advantage to the first degree relatives. So what, what people think is that in, probably in a milder form of, of certain kinds of cognitive changes and, and temperament and so forth, that it may be advantageous to the uh, family members, first degree family members. I think it's totally obvious. As a species, we need these people. Yeah. <laughs> the rest of us are sort of dull. <laughs> right. <laughs> so the question, just so we can all hear it, is it, during your creative process of creating the film, did you change the treatment with a goal of, as you just beautifully said, turning up the angels and turning down the demons, or trying to capture perhaps a mild manic state that would make you more creative? The answer is no. I mean, really, the way it happened was always thinking about the long game. And what that means is that I wanted to be creative in a sustained way for the rest of my life. And I had the faith that I could be creative in a sustained way for the rest of my life if I found the right balance of the medication and the creativity. And that, but a lot of this was, for instance, I, took, I learned transcendental meditation. When, when in doubt, I always had in mind, if there was any hypomania ever surfacing with these creative insights that I, if I felt, I could, now I know hypomania, I feel it coming. And a lot of times it comes as creative insights, but I know exactly where that's leading. So I nip it at the bud, even if it means being more medicated and numb for like three weeks because I'm thinking of the long game. The whole film, which I made the music for, I wrote, I directed, I did everything stable, on meds, in a sustained way, never ever lowering the medication to get what I wanted, even to the point where, you know, there's that scene of him on the roof looking up at the moon. And I remember we lit that whole scene, we were all ready to go, and my wife came to me and said, you know what, you seem a little bit hyper, you know? You, and, and I said, okay, we're gonna have to cancel the shoot, and I'm gonna have to go to bed now. And, and I knew, I was, I was like, there's no question about it. That's the only way I'd be able to ever create something like that, because it took years of sustained creative effort. I remember my psychiatrist at one point after I'd stopped my medication early on, and somewhat repeatedly early on, and he said, don't you, th and I get manic, and then I get depressed, and then I go back on my meds, and he said, don't you think you've run this particular experiment often oh. enough to know the outcome? <laughs> <laughs> the answer was, begrudgingly, yes. So the question, just for our filming, is given someone who's sharing her own experience with bipolar disorder, who can have very intense emotions when you feel like your mood is not too high or too low, is that part of the illness? Is that part of who you are and you know, your own experiences with that? Yeah, I, I think part of the mistake of the whole stigma is you're saying this is not who I am, this is not tied to who I am, you know, and it's part of who you are. It's not all of who you are, 
it is part of who you are, but human sensitivity and sensitive emotion is, is one of the greatest gifts. It's what defines us as being human beings. You know, I mean, it's, it's painful for some people, but, it's, but you're able to experience more of what it means to be human. It's a part of who you are in a, in a good way, you know, and, and it's, it's good to own that and embrace that. I, I would be, have a question for Tom, uh, which is, I think it's very hard for husbands and wives to be in the position of having to, you're talking about your father, um, it, for husbands and wives to have to say what they observe when, if you are going up and you're getting manic or getting depressed. I think you're very, very incredibly gentle about it, but I can t see and one of, the, one of the great things about your, your film is the, is the look on, on the mother's face. I can see you struggling sometimes to say it in the most tactful way, that walking on eggshells, but still doing it very well. But it looks like it's impossibly hard. With you, it's, cert with with you, you it's certainly not impossibly hard. You're incredibly faithful to your meds, and your illness um, doesn't deviate an awful lot from, from a, a simple path, at least at this time in our lives. Um, if you're running a little warm, it's not so hard to say so. If you're low and heading towards a bad patch, it, it's much harder to, to um, uh, apply rudder, you can't really help steer, uh, but what, what a person can do, I think, is just be there, be available, and let you know that I'm around, even though you don't necessarily want me around. <laughs> <clears throat> I will say, uh, sorry, just on that point, my wife uh, is the one person I listen to more than myself. And, and in that case, my father's a whole different story, but like, <laughs> he, the, but she, I will wrestle with myself when I know she's right. Am I going a little high? Am I being a little bit? And I'm like, oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> like, you know, in that case, like you said, restraining the demons, you know, and, and I'll listen to her in every single case. So it's good to have someone you know who you trust, who, 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 who can know you better than yourself. So the question is, what would be helpful, and what should a concerned friend, what would be good things to say and things to not say, to really support someone and get them back on the, the path of health? Um, the, one of the most important things is validating them. That, that's how you'll open the door. You say, I completely believe that you're experiencing these great insights and this is all of that and uh, express the things that I've said today. I, I will add an editorial comment from just to say having someone read An Unquiet Mind can be very powerful too because I think that Dr. Jameson really captures the battle of accepting a diagnosis and you get to see a life thrive once that happens. And I'll say this as someone who has mentored lots of med students and residents who are dealing with their own mood disorders, that seeing someone who has had such a successful career, who acknowledges that that's coming from accepting treatment and in that way managing, as you've said so eloquently, both of you this evening, that has been very helpful for a number of people too. So the question is insights you could have for young people, many of whom are choosing marijuana as their treatment of choice with disastrous consequences. So what might push them toward getting helpful treatment? I mean, like I said, I think it's the whole first learned edu education of this being called bipolar disorder. As much as, you know, we obviously can't change that term now, but you're, you're basically saying you have a disorder, dysfunction, disease of your brain, and they're saying, no, I'm, I'm having insights, and they're real. So how can I call that a disorder? So there's a disconnect. You know, <clears throat> if there was more of an understanding of, okay, you're experiencing insights right now, and they're real, and this isn't necessarily a disorder, but it's something 
which can be a disorder if you don't manage it right. It's something that can destroy your life if you don't manage it right. And, you know, just so you understand, with people with bipolar, if you smoke marijuana, it will spur hypomania, which will lead to mania, which will lead to suicidal depression. I would like to recommend your book because it's a terrific book. So you might just say the name of it and then... Find the Verdict, My Bipolar Life by Sherita Cole Brown. And then I would refer to Karen on the marijuana question because this is a really serious clinical issue and even more so in this day and age because of the impurity and the high concentration of, of marijuana. So. so for the marijuana, just to make a comment about that, I think what we've all come to appreciate and the literature is starting to strongly support is that there's a subset of young people that are vulnerable to marijuana in a way that other young people are not. And it is likely that they have a vulnerability, a biologic vulnerability to depression, to bipolar disorder, to schizophrenia. And with the marijuana, which is quite potent now, available, as well as it often being laced with other things like K2 or PCP, we are frequently taking care of young people in the hospital who have become psychotic, where they are delusional, where they're having hallucinations, where they're having false ideas, and they're terrified because of what the marijuana has triggered. What I absolutely acknowledge when I talk to young people about this is that feeling that lousy, it's understandable why you want to feel differently. The problem is it will only help you feel better for a very short time and then that will follow up with feeling even worse. And sometimes if you can get people to observe themselves or maybe have a trusted person in their life observe them, they can say, well, maybe you have a point. Maybe a day later or two days later, I am in worse shape because then that just leads to escalating use. But it is very dangerous, and this is an issue that we're seeing more frequently as we're taking care of patients here at Hopkins. I just want to add to that because my first experience of becoming, of triggering my condition was spurred by uh, marijuana. But it was spurred by it because I was at the dramatic writing program at NYU Tisch School, which is a very competitive screenwriting program, and I learned that if I smoked marijuana, it would create these explosive creative insights that I could speed write and create my most amazing work. And it was, according to my professors and teachers, my most amazing work. Uh, but that's because I was pushing my brain into a hypomanic state. So there's a confusion where you don't realize that the work wasn't nearly, it wasn't as creative. I'm not, I know I'm this film isn't like a masterpiece, but relative to what I wrote at the time, this is much better than, than what I wrote at the time. But when I was starting as a writer, it was like being tricked by these little flashes, you know, that are going to lead you into, the, into this abyss of ashes, you know? And that's a tempting thing if you don't understand that those creative flashes are just your brain about, uh, you know, headed on a, on a freight train to hell. And another thing we point out, it's a lot easier for young people to get marijuana than an appointment with a psychiatrist. And that is a huge challenge we have uh, that is for another night, but that is a major challenge. Any other questions? So the question is about through your portrayal in the film, but also your thoughts, what was your goal and how to portray psychiatrists and what did you want to share with people who might potentially be working with psychiatrists? Yeah, I wanted uh, well-intentioned psychiatrists so that they can see themselves in the film, but also see themselves through the eyes of the patient. Like I said, it, it, it comes down to re redefining and, and relearning what you've read in the, you know, in the medical books. Um, you know, obviously, you would have no other frame of reference than the medical books. So it's, it's no fault of, of a doctor if all they learn about this thing is the negatives and the disease. And, you know, so for them to open their mind to the other dimensions of it, like Kay's book opened my mind to, when before I used to see it only through the medical books, um, that I think that would open up a relationship 
uh, uh, where well-meaning doctors who don't undermine their patients, who validate them and who want what's best for them, uh, who don't want them to just get by, but want them to thrive, they'll be able to have a dialogue where now I trust my doctor because he's an amazing doctor, but I know he's not gonna, he doesn't, t he's not gonna tell me just, you know, stabilize and don't, don't thrive, you know. I know that he's going to work with me so that I can feel deep, rich emotion, but I also know that he could see the pitfalls that I, that I can't see. But the only reason I trust not to walk towards those pitfalls is because I know he's going to guide me to uh, a, a creative place. Okay, last question. So the question is, an oft-asked question is, can people be truly creative? Would Van Gogh have been able to create his masterpieces had he been treated? It's a, certainly an important question, and I think that uh, there's increasing in this day and age, people can be kept at much lower levels of medication than they used to be. I think always with people like Byron or like Robert Lowell or like Van Gogh, it's important, I mean, Van Gogh killed himself in his mid-30s. We have no idea what kind of paintings he would have done had he lived. He was in misery. He, he after his first involuntary hospitalization, he voluntarily placed himself in a hospital. He, he was in agony. So it's not an either or question in terms of, I mean, it, and it's a progressive disease. So if, if it's untreated, then it gets much worse, much harder to treat. I think it doesn't have to be an either or question in this day and age. I think people uh, and the scant literature that we have suggests that most artists and writers who are treated with medication actually feel like they're more as productive or more productive when they're treated. But it's, it's, a great, it's a very important question. And, and I feel that way. I mean, I feel much more productive on medication and much more creative on medication. And one of the things that Kay told me one time, is, which I, I found to be true, is that the first mania has all the insights, all the creative insights that you could ever have <laughs> is in the first mania. And it's true, because I had a second mania. And I, didn't, I was like, I knew this stuff already. You know, like, I, <laughs> you know. And, and, and I'm like, I got to go through the damage, with, with, and that's all I get out of it? You know, and um, it really has, is so dense, the insights that you get from that first mania, it's enough to last you for a lifetime of inspiration, uh, but you don't, like, you're basically just going to be damaging that, that, those insights if, if you go manic again. And, um, and also the thing is, I think I feel like art, is when it's connected to something meaningful. So when you're when you're reading a novel that you know it involves you know it's from the perspective of a mother or a, a, a sibling having a meaningful relationship with their their you know spouse or their whatever, you can't draw from a meaningful life to create meaningful art if you're not living a meaningful life that you need to be stable to sustain. I, I, can I add, I mean, you two have both actually delivered quite well despite your medication. And you've also both seen deep suffering. And, you know, it's not for the rest of us to say, don't take so much, we want more art. Um, you know, you deliver pretty well as you are. Well, I think that's a perfect place to end. What we're going to do at this point is welcome Dr. DiPaolo, our co-director of the Mood Disorder Center, to the podium and thank our incredible panel this evening. Thanks very much uh, uh, to all of you for coming. And thanks, Paul, for coming back again. It's great to see you. And, uh, and I do remember when we met again when we were at the theater when you showed the film, we screened the film. And I hadn't seen you really in eight or ten years. And uh, you gave an answer talking about real, genuine emotions and creativity and about your wife and your child. And I, I just wanted to jump up and cheer, which I did, by the way, and, uh, w which is terrific. So first off, thank you. I am one of those doctors who learned about this illness as an illness. And, but I think that in, in thinking about it, it is my teachers who've taught me also here that we got to remember the, disease, the concept of disease is a construct. It's a, it's a convention. When I ask my teacher what is a disease in reality, he says it's, just, it's life. It's life in an, in an altered condition, life in an altered state. 
but it is ver the very initiations of life. And so when you're talking about bipolar disorder and creativity, uh, you know, each of these things um, are things that, that happen to us because we are varied. And uh, uh, so it is very hard to find, if you will, uh, as Kay once said, the, the virtues of depression, okay? So it is hard to see the virtues in certain uh, forms of this thing. But, but I think the way Paul expresses it is, is actually a journey you've actually taken me on, Paul, because I was perfectly prepared to say, this thing will get you into trouble, so let's, let's uh, get rid of it, okay? But I think that it, as you see 1,000 or 5,000 or 10,000 patients with it, uh, I'm, I'm with you, okay? You're, you're very faithful to your treatment, okay? So you're doing everything I could possibly ask you to do. So why can't I at least try to think about <laughs> how you look at it, okay? And I was thinking as you were talking about the connections and everything else as a, a patient I had who I'd seen several times. Uh, and uh, I came in on the ward on uh, Meyer 4 and he was sitting in the lotus position on the floor about 35 yards away. And he, he yelled out at me because he recognized me coming through the door. I didn't quite recognize him yet. He was back, okay? And, uh, and he said, hey, DePaulo, it's not mania, it's cosmic consciousness. And, and, and I would simply argue that it's both, okay? Look, there is one other element here, and that is that we've got to take beauty and joy where we experience it, and it comes in very strange places sometimes. There are lots of things that we, we didn't necessarily choose, but when we get them, uh, uh, you know, um, we should uh, be prepared to appreciate that there's something in there that we shouldn't lose, and uh, we certainly don't want to lose this. So thank you, Paul, very much.